but I feel like I know her well. Uh, you can read all about her, of course, in her bio in the book. But I just think she's so affable, so personable. I know she's got this fabulous commitment to state education. I always think of her as being someone who's warm, witty and wise. I read her articles in the age, I love her, I'm through a transfer, etc. So I'm very thrilled on your behalf to welcome Jane Carroll. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd like that very much. Oh, all and wise, let's have a trash it and <laughs> let's out. Um, I want to talk about common sense, I think, because I look around me at the world today and I keep thinking there's so little of it. And I think public schools just make sense. I always have. I'm going to tell you why I think it. Um, you'll probably have your own reasons why you think they do too, but I think that's the problem. Public schools just make sense. And we're in a world where things making sense no longer seems to count. Where it's all about some uh, weird philosophy or ideology or set of expectations or rationalisations um, that I don't know about you, but I sit and listen to and think quietly. Well, no, I'm me. Not quietly. <laughs> um, often on Twitter. And I will often think, but that doesn't make any sense. How often do you listen to learned presentations and have a little voice in your head that says, but that just doesn't make any sense? Am I the only person? Is there anyone else? Two of you? <laughs> Four, ten? The entire goddamn room? room? Entire goddamn room? Is that what we're voting for? Yeah. yeah. Good, otherwise I'd have to throw out everything I've just written out to say. Um, and I think part of the problem is, it seems to me, experts who tell us all sorts of learned things um, and have all sorts of evidence to prove it, but it doesn't seem to fit into our lives. I can promise you that I'm not an expert. I'm often asked to be an expert, and that's really interesting, particularly in the media, because what I've learned is that an expert is someone who sounds like they know what they're talking about. They don't actually know any more than anybody else, really. They just sound like they know what they're talking about. And most of the time, they just confuse us all. I remember the worst time in my life for experts, perhaps it was yours too, was when I had a new baby. That's when experts really start to get into parents' heads and destroy any residual faith they may have had in their own common sense or natural ability to raise a child. Child has been going on for a very long time. And look, most of us get it wrong. <coughs> but they survive. They don't turn out to, to be monsters. Well, there's a short period of time when they are monsters and you have to deal with that. But by and large, most of them, no matter how badly you go wrong, as long as you don't actually, you know, brutalise them, tend to turn out all right in the end. And yet the level of panic. I remember once I was at a, um, a function and there was a young woman sitting next to me. She would have been a good 20 or so years younger than I was and she was very, very heavily pregnant. She was very polite, so she was asking me, probably with very little real interest, but it was nice of her anyway, about my life and came out that I had two children, two daughters in their twenties, and she, that's when she looked interested and her eyes lit up and she said to me, oh, that's fantastic, you're at the end of this journey and I'm at the beginning. She was already looking for experts and she said to me, what have you learned? And I said, bloody hell, that's a good question at a lunch after three glasses of wine. I said, well, I had to think about it but I'll get back to you. Anyway, a little while later, I saw her getting her bag and looking like she was about to go. And I had actually come up with an answer. So I went up to her and I said, look, I've come up with an answer, but you're not going to like it. She looked a little startled. And I said, here it is. Your children will 
disappoint you. And you will disappoint your children. So just relax. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter whether you sleep them on a sheepskin or you don't sleep them on a sheepskin. It doesn't matter what kind of nappies you use. It doesn't matter whether you feed them organic that you've minced yourself with your toes lovingly at four o'clock in the morning or just straight from a jar in the supermarket. None of that matters a damn. Whatever it is that makes you feel good and it makes your life a bit easier and it'll be hard enough, whatever you do with a new baby, I recommend that's what you do. And anyone who tells you you're doing it wrong in any newspaper articles will tell you a child will die if you sleep them on their back or their side or their front or any way you want to. Just tear them up ritually, burn them and don't read them. I don't suppose she paid any attention to me at all. I also yelled at her as she retreated away from me and saved your money and send them to a public school. And the reason I was thinking all that was when I had my first child and I went off to Tresillian as a you know, baby was three months old and I don't know what I'm doing. I remember coming home from the hospital and I remember walking in through the door and, and holding this baby and thinking to myself, how could they let me out with her all on my own? I had no idea what to do. But you pick it up, the baby and what you ought to do. Um, and you don't as well, you learn by trial and error, as everybody learns everything. But I went off to Tresillian to try and learn you know, this new parents group. And out of that new parents group, I made a group of female friends. And we still see each other. Our, our oldest kids are 26, our youngest are 23. We met when our kids were th first kids were three to six months old. And we still see each other. We met every week for 10 years, which is pretty amazing. And we had all the intense discussions about, you know, the organic baby food versus the, whatever's in the back of the cupboard. Um, whether you should sterilise toys or just, I don't know, wipe them on your gene and give it back to them, which was my technique. Um, they didn't get sick. It was okay. Um, you know, whether you should discipline, blah, 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 blah. I mean, we spent at least a year discussing colours of poo. I'll never forget that. At the time it was fascinating. I now can't believe that I did it. But there you go. It's all very peculiar and you're not good. But when we come to this point in our development where our kids are in our 20s and I look at those children that I've watched grow up and I've seen them go to a variety of different schools, I've seen them be fed varieties of different foods, I've seen them be brought up in varieties of different ways. I promise you, if you line them up against a wall and said, pick which ones went to the expensive private, which pick which ones went to the bog standard public, which ones ate organic, which ones didn't, which ones, you know, blah, 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 you couldn't. You seriously couldn't. They've turned out more or less the way they were always going to turn out. And a lot of people have spent a lot of money. Some of those other mothers have spent, I calculate, more than $300,000 more than my husband and I have spent on our children's education. Now, that's got to be a departure from common sense, really, wouldn't you think? When you look at the end results and you can't see the difference, is there any other purchase you would spend $300,000 on? And when you got to the end of it, go, I can't, what, how, Ooh. and not scream from the rooftops. But somehow, we've been marketed to so well that we don't think about that at all. We don't apply our common sense. Very clever marketing can get us to leave our common sense behind, and I think to a large extent. It's certainly in schools that really has. When I think about why sending a child makes good sense, I just scribbled down a few ways in which it does. The first is environmentally. <coughs> all over Melbourne, all over Sydney, all over most cities in Australia and quite a few larger country areas, People get up in the morning and they drive their children a long way away from where they live to a school they selected because they've told themselves that it answers their unique and special needs. Am I right? Is that not what lots of people are doing? Which is why when it's school holidays, do you notice what happens to the traffic? People even talk about it on the radio. Oh, of course, 
school holidays, and that's why the traffic's so great. Taxi drivers routinely discuss it with you. Oh, I love school holidays. You can get. So why does it make sense? That we're all. And the funny thing is, just as the people who live near <coughs> me are getting in their cars and driving their children over the other side of Sydney to take their kids to schools over there, a whole lot of people over there are getting in their cars and driving to my suburb to send them to schools near me. Because there seems to be this belief that the further a school is away from you, the better a school it must be. I got told all the time when I first started standing up for public schools and really arguing with people, why are you sending them to a fee charging school? What is your reason for that? They go, oh, well, it's different from you. Where you live, the public schools are marvellous. But here, they're all absolutely terrible. But anyone who lived near me told me that the school, public schools near me were terrible too. <coughs> and that the public schools where they lived were way better, but far too far away to go to. Somehow, the private schools that were in the same area were not far too far to drive to. Don't ask me why. And I remember thinking, this doesn't make any sense. We're all swapping our kids across the city because we think something that's a little further away is going to be better than something that's close to home. Well, that's pure marketing because one of the things marketing understands, and private schools have a real advantage here, is that marketing scarcity is a really great idea. You see all those ads where they say, hurry while stocks last? I'm sure they've got acres of stocks. They're having a sale because they can't get rid of the shit, okay? That's why they have a sale. So they've got acres of stock. But they know that if you tell them, if they tell you that you've got to hurry because this is very special and there's only a few of them, you're much more likely to buy them. If they said to you, we've got so much of this crap and we can't offload it on anybody, is that attractive? No. So one of the things that marketing always does is market scarcity. So the whole idea of you have to travel a long way away is a way of saying all these good schools, they're very rare. There's very few of them and they're all a long way away. And this, I'm sorry to say, piques a lot of parents' vanity. Because you see, choice of school has to a large extent become a sort of banner a good parent banner. And you can boast about where you send your child to school, depending on where it is, of course. Um, and that's marketing. That's making it into a prestige premium product that you feel really glad to identify yourself with. I don't know if this happens in Melbourne, but it certainly does in Sydney. Um, there's a lot of generally very large four-wheel drives. We get back to the environment again. Um, and they've got often stickers on the back which says, you know, rah, rah, Riverview or something like that. I've never seen a public school sticker which said, rah, rah, Chatswood High. I'm deeply relieved about that. I think that's excellent. <coughs> it's so, why do parents want to have stickers about their kid's school on their car? <coughs> it's not their school, it's their child's school. Stop it. <laughs> and also, it's just boasting about your class status. And that's irritating as well. So if we're environmentally, it makes no sense for us to be transporting kids and putting more fossil fuels in the air so that we can destroy their future utterly. At the same time, I can be driving them across and causing more pollution to ensure their future. That is an entirely ridiculous and contradictory argument. Uh, what's another reason? Sending a child to a local school is actually a really good way of keeping them safer. Most of you here are teachers, uh, I know you're principals, but once you've been teachers, you must have at some point in your lives seen Looking for Alan Brand in your film. Remember the beginning where all the um, Italian mamas keep an eye on, um, I've forgotten the protagonist's name for a moment now, but she's walking down the street and she's really saying, I can't get away with anything because everybody's watching me and they all know the way. I think the same about sending a child to a local school. From a common sense perspective, it is safer because they are known. Now, sometimes this is unpleasant. People did occasionally tell me when they saw my 14-year-old who was going through a rebellious stage, smoking near the railway station, and that was news I didn't want to know about, frankly. I hope she'd grow out of it. Fortunately, she did. But nevertheless, 
People were watching her. They knew what she was doing and they were telling me about it. While some of that news may have been unwelcome, it's important to know that the community has their eye out for the local kids. If you send your kids to a school a long way away, nobody knows them. Nobody's looking after them. Oh, if you want to improve the real estate values in your area and you are a parent, work to improve your public school. You will all know of areas in Melbourne which have one of those public schools that has an enviable reputation. People do all sorts of things to get their kids into that school. Some of them lie. I'm sure you may have come across this if you're lucky enough to be the principal of such a school. They lie to get their kids into those schools. What also happens is some canny people reckon, realise that if they actually buy a property in the drawing area for that school, that's a much better investment than paying school fees. School fees are dead money. Once you pay them, you've paid them. And if I'm right, at the end of it, you really can't tell the difference between the public school kid and the private school kid, then it's really dead money. It's a lot for a sticker on the back of your car. But if you buy the property in the area, that doesn't just mean you get your kid into the school that everybody wants to get into, rightly or wrongly, it's mostly perception of them, but it also means that you're going to get capital gain out of the house, which is the most tax efficient investment you can make in Australia. It makes absolute sense. So if you want to increase these real estate values of your area and your home and therefore benefit financially and therefore be able to help your kids when they get to university and it seems may have to pay the most extraordinary kind of debt these days, particularly if they're a girl. If you've got daughters, oh boy, this latest round of deregulation and compounding interest rates is going to mean that young women are going to have to pay far more money to get a degree than young men, even though they earn about a million dollars a year, a million dollars less over their lifetime than those same young men, which is really clever, isn't it? Get a degree that's worth less to you and pay more for it. Excellent, works well. So there's a lot of parents out there who are now starting to think the common sense thing to do would be to send their children to a public school and help make sure that their children don't have a compounding debt over their head when they first when they go out to work, which can last for a very long time. <coughs> depending on the kind of degree they want to do, and of course depending on their gender, which is outrageous. That's a common sense decision as well. In fact, I argue something else, naughtily. I don't know whether you as principal is going to improve what I'm just about to say, but I argue something else too. I always advise people, I, I have a speech I make which is called Things I've Learned and it's about all sorts of different things, but one of the things I sneak in there because I never ever leave public education out of any opportunity I get, is I always say send your children to a public school, it's almost always to groups of women, um, it's a win-win for parents and they look at me like I'm a crazy person and here's why it's a win-win. If you send your children to a public school, I say, and they do really, really well, everyone will say, wow, you must be a fantastic parent because it's a really shit school. <laughs> if you send them to a public school and they do really, really badly, they go, well, it's a really shit school. If you send your children to a private school and they do really, really well, everyone goes, oh, it's such a fantastic school. If you send your children to a private school and they do really, really badly, they go, you must be really shit parents because it's a really good school. <laughs> and I say to them, and you're paying for this. Are you sure that makes sense? They laugh and then they look worried. Which is, of course, entirely my um, idea. I also believe there are lots of other common sense reasons for choosing public education. That's one of the reasons we did for our children. From kindergarten to year 12, I'd like to promise you, comprehensive co-ed public schools. That's why I say $300,000, we reckon. Um, after tax, which no one mentions. I wanted my kids to know that there are as many good ways to live a life as there are people living lives. I didn't want them to just think that there was the Catholic way of living a good life or the um, 
rich person's way of giving a, living a good life, or even the smart people's way of living a good life. I actually wanted them to learn that there were all sorts of people with all sorts of different interests, beliefs, talents, abilities, and lack thereof, who were living good lives. I really wanted them to see for themselves how a society, a community, a diverse, the richness of a diverse community really works. We pay a lot of lip service to diversity in Australia. In fact, the word diversity is in itself lip service. It's just about a whole lot of human beings living together who have different ideas and different opinions and that maybe have different genital arrangements and possibly different skin colours and hair styles and really, who cares? Who makes such a lot of fuss about it? But I think that public schools, one of the things they do, well, they must do better, not because they're nicer, but because they can't say no legally, is enrol all sorts of kids from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of families with all sorts of beliefs. There's a lot of propaganda out there that public schools are kind of hotbeds of feminist, homeless, sexual converting atheism. <laughs> Johnny is hilarious. I mean, public schools are schools. They're made up of all sorts of different people. There are as many devoutly religious teachers in a public school as there are devoutly atheist teachers in a religious school. It's just that in a public school, the Christian teachers are allowed to admit to their belief. In a religious school, with some notable exceptions, it's much harder for the unbelieving teacher to admit to their unbelief. Yet it shouldn't be. It's important for kids to know that there are a range of different views. That makes sense not to pretend to be something you're not. That's the other thing. When I said I was going to send my children to public schools, a lot of people said to me, you're sacrificing your children for your principles. Honestly, I'm not kidding you. You will all know this is the kind of attack you get, particularly if you're seen as a parent with choice. And I thought to myself, well, first of all, I don't agree with you that I'm sacrificing anything. I think there are benefits that they will get that they can't get from the practical. But also I thought, so sorry, what do you do with your principles? If you're, you're saying that I'm sacrificing my children to my principles, are you therefore saying that the minute a principle gets a bit difficult to live up to, you just drop it? Because I don't think that's very good modelling. Aren't private schools meant to be about values? I don't think that's right. I think if you have a principle, you should live it, shouldn't you? You should live it. And we try to do that. Of course we got it wrong a lot of the time, but that $300,000 really helped us to stick to it. <laughs> Also, I think because of the richness and diversity in public schools, and because you cannot be, I mean, New South Wales has selective schools and there's academic selective schools, and they're real hot houses and they really push kids. They're not my favourite style of school. Um, but you cannot be as one note about the way you teach kids because you've got such a range of abilities in your school. You have to learn how to get the best out of kids from really diverse backgrounds and really um, many of them from very difficult backgrounds. So getting people to comply is not necessarily the first objective of a public school. Of course you want them to behave, but I don't think that's quite the same as comply. Um, I sent my daughters to a no uniform school. I know. <laughs> what kind of a radical, ghastly mother was I? Particularly as it's clear that many parents believe that if you simply put a child in a uniform that looks like it was designed for the brave new world of 1927, they are immune from drugs. <laughs> yep, they won't, they, you can't get anywhere near those kids. Parents a magic force field emanating from the voter. Um, I don't know, I'm in business, I'm a marketer. Let's pretend for a minute I was a drug dealer. I could stand on the corner outside the school where they charge, I don't know, twenty thousand dollars a year in fees. Or I could stand on the corner outside the school where they charge nothing in fees. Which business model should I follow? <laughs> I'll leave that to you to answer. But I'd suggest common sense will give it to you. 
So I don't, but I think those uniforms also indicate compliance and attempt to get, what's the word uniform there? Did anyone watch Life at Nine, the documentary on the ABC? A few people have watched it. Did anyone see that horrific moment? They're lovely kids, lovely families, all of it's lovely. No one's being abused or beaten up or anything like that, but there was a horrific moment, at least for me. They got the kids, they ran an experiment and they were testing for compliance and versus creativity. And they asked the kids to go from easels and a whole range of paints, from black and brown to the brightest possible colours. These kids are nine years old. And they said to them, you can paint anything you like, but you can only use black and brown. They all desperately wanted to use the other colours, all of them. They talked about it, and oh, I wish I could... None of them did. Yeah, are you do don't preempt my story. <laughs> Me. <sighs> One little girl did. She put the tiniest gold dot on the edge of her painting. Now she didn't go to public school, she went to Montessori school, but she came from a family where her name was Shine, which gives you some idea about their ideas of compliance <laughs> and uniformity. And I thought, well, thank God, Shine, but at the same time, I also felt that that was tragic, that the only point of hope about these little kids, who at nine were so compliant that they stuck to the black and brown against their will, was one little gold dog. We should be up in arms. That's disaster. That's, that's right ground for dictatorships. It's right ground for just the people who follow the rules, for those who just do what they're told without questioning. To get nine-year-olds to this red, pink, and gold, and blue, because a nice, mild man of man said they couldn't. We have failed as a generation. When I saw that, I thought, that's disgraceful. And it's the enemy of common sense. Why would a nine-year-old bitch resist? Shh. I prefer a nine-year-old that draws on the goddamn walls. Frankly, I don't care what colour they use. <coughs> and the problem is we've been overtaken by anxiety. When you talk to parents in your schools, whether they're coming to have a look at your school to send their children there or whatever they're doing. What do you think the overriding emotion is that most parents have? Your secondary school principals. I think in secondary schools it's really exaggerated. What is the biggest emotion you're dealing with? Fear. It's fear. Everybody's frightened. My mother comments on it. She grew up, she was an adolescent in Manchester during the Second World War. They were dropping bombs on her. She was going into air raid shelters. Her parents were less anxious about her than today's parents are about their children. She was allowed to roam the streets, ride a bicycle. She was allowed to go to the cinema on her own at 14. And she also went to the local school. Everybody did. They were dropping bombs on them and parents were less anxious. I think anxiety has been deliberately driven. But there's something else going on. Do any of you know anything about choice theory? Choice theory is the study of choice. See, there are experts on everything. But actually, choice theory is kind of interesting. Because what choice theory basically says is that choice drives anxiety. The more choices you have, the more anxious you become. And the reason for that is there's no such thing as a perfect choice. Whenever you choose one thing, you have to not choose a whole lot of others. And for perfectionist driven parents, Choosing any one school means they can't choose a whole lot of others. So even when they make a choice, they feel absolutely churned up that did they choose the right one. Because that other school had great drama and that school had a lovely principal and that school, whatever it was. They've chosen this school because it's got not such great drama but whatever it else that they've chosen. But instead of feeling content with their choice, 
they actually feel worse because they were offered a whole lot of other alternatives. So the very fact that we've kind of fetishised choice in education has driven anxiety in parents because they feel it is their responsibility to find the perfect school for their child. Sorry to tell you this, there is no perfect school. Just like there is no perfect child, just like there is no perfect parent. There are just schools. And I have a view, maybe I'm crazy, most schools are pretty good. Regardless of whether they're public or Catholic or independent, they're pretty good. And most kids do okay in them. And most kids make friends in them. And we know, for example, there's a lot of movement between systems and schools but, uh, from year four in primary school up until year seven. But then there's very little. It's a little bit around year 10 when they go into the last two years. But actually, most people, once they've chosen school, it works out fine. It works out fine. We also know, for example, this has been proved over and over and over again, Barbara Preston is the latest to um, bring out some figures, that kids from comprehensive secondary schools outperform both their selective and private school peers when they get to university. They do better. I sometimes wonder if it's because they come from an environment which is less about compliance which is more diverse, which is richer. And also, the kids who get to university from those schools were the kids who were meant to get to university. They were the ones with the talent to get there, rather than being hothoused or forced into going towards university. I do have another theory, and that is that it may be a great deal easier to go from one underfunded public institution to another underfunded <laughs> public institution and that it must be a heck of a shock from some of those kids from the gilded halls of some of the luxurious schools I've seen to go into your average university tutorial. They must just go, how do I cope here? I know you are, but I'm serious. I'm serious. Another reason to use your common sense and send your kids to public school. But anxiety is really driving people to seek safety, to seek reassurance, to seek being told that they've made the right decision. Spending a lot of money on something is one way to reassure yourself that you've done what you can. I've had friends actually say to me, you know, I don't know whether the school's any good or not, but when I'm dragged up to answer for my mistakes in the therapist's office, at least I can say, well, I spent, I sent them to the best school I could afford. So in a way, it's a kind of I did what I could. I did what I could. A fear of our own teenagers. It's so sad. Teenagers are fine. And my God, I had two. And they were unbelievably difficult when they were teenagers. But they grow up. Now they become really quite charming. Really charming. Sometimes I look at particularly my eldest who went through a hormonal storm, the like of which I have never seen again. And I think to myself, ah. Oh, who are you? What did you do with the awful Polly? <laughs> but I'm awfully glad you're here. Because she's such a sane, thoughtful, interesting person. And if you'd seen her at 15, you wouldn't have thought there was a hope in hell of that ever happening. But I'll bet you've seen kids like that your entire careers. That parents were panic stricken about. That you wondered about. And yet, they turned up to visit the school again a few years later, and they were delightful. And that's what mostly happens. It's what mostly happens. And I love parents to just calm down a bit. I think if we could ramp down the anxiety and tension around our kids and around the schools we choose and around the suburb we live in and around all the things we go on and on and on about, the whole world would improve immeasurably. And I actually think kids' results would improve immeasurably. And perhaps, perhaps they put more than a gold dot on the corner of a painting because they feel like they were in a world where they were encouraged to take risks, to make mistakes, and sometimes break the rules. Oh, I know, I'm saying to real real school principles about breaking the rules. All the most interesting kids break the rules. 
because they're trying them out. That's why it was so sad to me when I saw that little, those little nine-year-olds refusing to break the rules. I am used to, I gave it up this year, but I used to teach at uh, the University of Western Sydney and a subject of intense academic rigour, may I tell you? I taught advertising creative. Yes. I was that amazing at an academic. And uh, one thing I noticed which really disturbed me was how often my students would ask me what I wanted from them. And they would try to take my brief, my advertising brief, I used all real briefs from my own career, so they were not made up, they were actual real um, briefs from actual real clients. They would take my brief and they would often just regurgitate it back to me in slightly different words and look pleased like I should give them an A. And I used to say to them, why would a client pay you tens of thousands of dollars to give them back what they've already given you? Oh, what do you want? And my answer absolutely blew some of their minds away and didn't know what to do. I would say to them, I want to see something I've never seen before. I want you to shock me. I want you to make me laugh. I want you to make me cry. I want you to outrage me. I want you to horrify me. I want you to delight me. I want to see something I've never been seen before. And the look on their faces was tragic to me. However, there was a group. There was always a group that got it and did it really well. And you know who who they were? They were the bad boys. They were the boys who all got C's or, you know, they got P's. They just, P's get degrees, they got passes, they did the minimum. They used to sit up the back of the lecture and, you know, I don't know, leer at the girls, make dirty jokes. I'm sure they were sexist and racist and all sorts of things. But they kept inside their belly a little light of subversion. They were not obedient. They did not comply. There was a part of them that was still alive. And when they got into my class, they do things because deliberately to shock me. Instead, I go, that's great. I'm paying attention. That's good. You, you're not boring me. Excellent. A. And they reacted in absolute shock. I remember a number of them used to say, geez, Miss, thanks for the good marks. But I'd say, you earned them. Because you surprised me. You aren't just trying to find out what I want and giving it to me. You are breaking the rules. I believe that kids from the rich soup that is public schools are more likely to keep that little spark alive. Not entirely, but more likely. Partly because you haven't got the time to stamp it out of them quite as efficiently as some of the others. <laughs> the other reason that fear is ramping up is because we're a society in transition. <coughs> um, some of you in the room will have given birth. I don't mean had children, I mean actually given birth. You will all know about transition. Transition in the birth process is the process between the opening of the cervix and the movement of the baby's head into the birth canal, the crowning. And that is the point at which most women go completely do that because the regular rhythm of the opening of the cervix changes and you go into transition and it goes all out of whack. And that's when everything, you know, when sometimes labour stops when adrenaline cuts in, when pain relief is asked for, all that kind of thing. Transition is the scary time because you've gotten used to where you were but you don't know what you're going to do. And I've thought for quite a while that the whole of the world, really, is in transition. We know what we used to be like but we don't know what we're going to. And that always creates a sense of out of control. It does in birth and it does in life. And I think we're a society in transition. So a lot of people are looking backwards towards old certainties. Instead of looking forwards. I mean, I loved hearing James talk about innovation and new ideas. I think that's really valuable and really important. But we're not a society that likes innovation or new ideas at the moment. We like looking backwards because it feels safer. Accountability has a lot to do with this. Because accountability is about measurement and it's about holding people to account. So it's about holding people to blame. 
And that, what's the first thing that people do if someone says, I want you to take on this task and you will be accountable for it? What's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to go, let's find out all the new ideas in this area, or are they going to say, let's look at what's been done before? They're going to look at what's been done before. Because they can't be hung out to dry for making a mistake. Job of accountability as a, as a concept is that it is about, it, it forbids mistakes. If you make a mistake, you'll be held accountable, you'll be blamed, you could lose your job, it'll be awful. That's what accountability's underlying subtle message is. So what we have become is a society that avoids failure rather than seeking success. The opposite of an innovative society. Now, technology goes on changing the world while we're all desperately trying to cling on to the past. So we're, that's why I say we're in transition. We're looking backwards and holding on to old certainties because we can see how rapidly things are changing and how fundamentally, but we don't know what we're going to, we don't know where we're going to end up. And that makes us all very anxious. It's normal. It's human to be anxious about it. I would like to replace accountability in all areas with responsibility. Because if you do something responsibly, you don't have to get it right, do you? You can make a mistake. You can fail. Because the word responsibility has within it room to move. It has the word response. Accountability doesn't. There's no room to move with the word accountability. It is a hard, mathematical, rigid word. Responsibility is a human, fluid, open, grown-up, mature, non-blame-oriented word. If we could remove some of the blame that is thrown around, the judgment, and the very fact that so many parents choose private schools is because they're afraid of being judged as a parent. They haven't got a clue why they're choosing the school. They just know everybody else is. So they will do, because they don't want anyone to blame them if things go wrong. They are frightened of being held accountable for how their child turns out. Yet if you're, we're all responsible for how we bring up our child, I'm never quite convinced about being responsible for how they turn out, given that there were times in my own parenting journey where I really didn't want to be held responsible for either of them. Which is another thing I think we get wrong in society. We obsess about outcomes. I know it's a word that education communities love too. Outcomes are really important. They are. But you can't control outcomes. Sorry, but you can't. You can control inputs. You can control how hard you study. But you can't control the fact that you might vomit all day long the exam because you picked up a stomach bug. That will ruin your outcome. But you'll still learn because you concentrate on the inputs. I know this because, or I learned this lesson, when I was first just coming out about public education and why I felt so strongly about it. And I was asked by Marilyn Parker to fill in for her column, which she had in the Daily Telegraph. Do you, is Marilyn Parker someone who writes in Victoria much? Anyway, great education journalist and very pro-public school. She's retired now, as so many good journalists have. And I was thrilled, and I spent such a long time researching this column. I worked and worked and worked. I got all the stats. I wrote it up. I kept five times, rewrote the whole thing again. You've never seen anyone sweat so hard, and I've never sweated so hard since, I can tell you, but it was the first. Out I went, it got published, unchanged. I was proud as punch, but I can guarantee you that absolutely nobody read it. I can guarantee you no one read that column because it appeared on the 11th of September 2001, the 12th of September 2001. Nobody read that column. And that's what I mean about I could control my, the inputs, but I couldn't control the outcome. Because the outcome is out of our hands. The outcome is bigger than us. But if you control the inputs, if you've put your time, effort, and energy into the research, the learning, you'll never lose those. Did I waste my time putting all that energy and time into writing that column? No, I did not. I have recycled and regurgitated a lot of things I learned then many times over. 
It was definitely worthwhile doing, and it taught me a really big lesson. The outcome is out of our control. And we're so terrified as parents about the outcome. But actually, we just do our best. If only we concentrated on the inputs, the day-to-day -day parenting, the stuff we can control, rather than constantly anticipating the future and trying to control what we absolutely can't and making ourselves miserable. And I would like to put to you, our children miserable at the same time. There's another thing people like to talk about that I'd like to apply some common sense to. Sorry, I'm probably attacking lots of shitless here that I probably shouldn't. High expectations. <laughs> A friend of mine once said to me, how do you feel when you get what you expect? I said, oh, neutral? He said, yeah, that's right. You get what you expect, you feel neutral. How do you feel when you get more than you expect? Oh, fantastic. That's really exciting. You know, it's wonderful. I said, yep. How do you feel when you get less than you expect? Terrible. Really, really, really disappointed. He said, yeah. He said, so when we expect our kids to get 99.9, .9, the best they're ever going to feel is neutral. We've taken the joy out of achievement. It's one of the things high expectations risk, taking the joy out of achievement. I know what you mean by high expectations. You mean... Each child attempted to do their very best, which for some may not be particularly a 99.9. .9. There's all sorts of bests. But even so, I think that expecting them runs the risk of creating a generation of kids with no joy in them. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I certainly have living where I live in a very middle class area, very high achieving, very high expectations, very academic development. Error. But the highest achieving kids are the ones with less joy. They're very serious and very anxious. The number of young 25-year-olds I now who know who are on Zoloft is scary. And it's this driven, driven, driven. And the idea, oh my God, that competition is everything. You know what? The people most in favour of any competition are those who are most likely to win it. That's why the privileged and the powerful love to preach competition to the poor and the vulnerable. Because they know they've got it in the bag. And that to me is disgusting. <coughs> Education is now talked about as a market. Education is not a market. Education is how you prepare people to deal with markets. It should be the furthest thing from a market you could possibly find, particularly for our children. Passy Salberg says that most learning can only take place in a completely fear-free environment. Kids learn best when they don't even realise they're learning. They learn best when they're in that spot, that spot, flow, that moment of absorption, whatever it is, when they really get excited by something, when they're not thinking, I have to be the best, I have to get 10 out of 10, I have to get an A, I have to, I have to give the teacher exactly what they want, I have to be the winner or else I'm a loser. That's not teaching anybody anything except having a miserable bloody life. No, you just need to get to that point where you just go, wow, this is really exciting and I'm reading a book for the first time and I'm loving it. It's all I wanted from my kids. Saw so my daughter reading a book the other day, I thought, oh yes, we won. It was an autobiography of Joe Brand, the English comedian, I don't care, it was a book. I was very impressed. I think there's a lot of ideas out there that it's very hard to challenge. That somehow anything that you can get that's public, that's inclusive, is by definition not as good. You're the generic brand, the private schools, some of the premium brands. It's a great shame that a lot of people um, give me a lot of um, criticism. They say I concentrate too much on high fee schools and most of the kids don't go to those, and therefore that's an irrelevant argument. I'll tell you my reason for that, and it is again back to my marketing. Think about French couture. Think about Chanel. 
think about, I don't know, who are the other big, you know, uh, La Croix, all those French fancy fashion houses. There's about 10 women in the world who buy to them. Now, they feature the, you know, French Fashion Week and the parades in every newspaper and magazine across the world. They're selling to 10 customers. Probably more than, oh, I exaggerate, 100. But I don't exaggerate much. So why do they bother? They don't make any money out of them. Because they're the advertising for the Chanel lipstick, the um, small little bits of that glamour that ordinary women can buy. Ordinary women can buy a Chanel lipstick. It's vastly overpriced for what it is. But it's affordable and has that flow on from Coco Chanel and all those couture parades and all of that. It's my intention that elite private schools operate in exactly the same way. They are the couture line, which most people can never afford to go to, that's true. But they buy the systemic Catholic school or the little Christian school or the lower fee private school and it's like buying the Chanel lipstick or the skincare from a particular couture brand. They get a little bit of glamour. So that's why they matter. Because they're the aspirate, you know, that awful word, aspirational. I did say once and I still think it. I hope the aspirational aspirate on their aspirations. <laughs> but, on oh, this one other thing that's marketing genius by um, private education. And that is, they offer the perfect dilemma for women in transition from one way of being to another. It is still considered illicit, I think, for women to want to work because they like going to work, because they like having their own money or they like to use their education in the public sphere. It's still, particularly if they have children, it becomes sort of not really a good thing. Notice how the private schools solve that dilemma beautifully. They don't mean to, but they, this is the benefit. Working women can say, Oh, I only go to work to pay the school fees. See how it gives them permission to do what they want to do and still be a good mother. Brilliant. Marketing operates by knowing what your real motives are. Not what you say. Not what you'd like to believe. Not what you want other people to believe. What's actually going on? And there are two things going on when people respond to marketing. Hope and fear. Those are the only two things that are going on. And a lot of private school marketing offers a way of increasing your hope and reducing your fear. If you want to improve your marketing in public schools, every parent you look at who's looking at possibly purchasing you, sorry to use commercial terms, it's my background, just remember, elevate their hopes, reduce their fears. So you've got to do it. Once you know what their hopes are, help them to feel more hopeful. Once you know what their fears are, help them to sue those fears. That's all selling is. All selling. Here's an example. It's a good idea to know exactly what you're dealing with. What, what, are, you, what are you actually working with? Hope or fear predominantly? I would suggest in secondary public schools you don't have much of a dilemma. You're mostly dealing with fear, as you said. But here's an example of how you can get it wrong if you don't have the correct empathy for your market. Most people say that that skin care is bold hope, don't they? Have you heard that expression? Skin care expensive, skin care is bold hope? It's not. And I'll tell you why it's not. Women are not stupid. They don't think that if they use this expensive skin care in seven days, they will look younger. They don't even think in seven months they will look younger, even if they use it every single day. They don't think that. It's bottled fear because what they really think is if I don't use it, I'll look even worse. So what they're using this as a preventative. So when you're looking at a prospective parent, have a good think about what are they hoping for and what are they fearing and how do I deal with those things. They'll give you all sorts of rationalisations. Don't believe the rationalisations. It's about hope and fear. But there is something that's really interesting that has happened recently, and I don't know if you've noticed it. Notice the rhetoric changing around schools. I don't hear people saying, to the same extent as I did, that they're making sacrifices to send their children to private school. I'm not hearing that kind of rationalisation as often as I did say three or four years ago. And here's my theory on why not. Gosky. Gosky is fascinating from a marketing perspective. Now, 
it's incredibly sensible from the point of view of a funding scheme. It's incredibly sensible from the point of view of re-looking at education in Australia and how we can help kids who need more help get the help they need to achieve their potential. All of which are things that I absolutely fundamentally believe in. But I'm not going to tell you about that because you know that more about that than I do. I'm going to tell you from a marketing perspective, and marketing is really common sense. From a marketing perspective, why Gonski is so important. It's given the public education community and the community as a whole a focus. It's a simple, unusual word, Gonski. It's catchy. Remember when stupid Kevin Rudd wanted to change the name to something idiotic like, I don't know, improving our schools for the future? I think they're one of those blah blah things. I don't know what it is with politicians and wanting to put labels on things. What did Tony Abbott call the MH17 thing? Bringing them home? Don't do it. We don't. It makes it sound phony. Even if it isn't phony, it makes it sound phony. I think they think they've got to push the benefit or something, but not like that. Gonski's brilliant. One word. Unusual. Everybody knows what it stands for. Most ordinary people don't understand the Gonski funding scheme. They have no interest in understanding the Gonski funding scheme. It's not important to them. All they know is that it's a scheme that will help poorer kids get more out of their education, get more money and help them do better. And you know what? Most Australians still think, oh, that's a good thing. I like that. Tick. That's all we need them to know. That's all we need them to know. And it's all we need them to believe in. And I think that that's changed the argument. The argument is no longer about I've got to save my kids. It's more about how do we save the, all those kids? And it's Gonski that's given people the language to talk about that. They may still be wanting to move their own kids in the private school. That's yet to come. But if we can get more of the funds to the kids that need it most, that's really important. I was incredibly heartened by a survey that's probably published in the age, but it was certainly published in the city my hero a few weeks ago, <coughs> which looked at why people didn't like the federal budget. And what they said was this. Well, I don't think it's going to affect me much personally, but I think it's going to affect people who are already doing it tough, the vulnerable, the elderly, the unemployed, very harshly. And I don't like the idea of that. And I don't want my society to be like that. I thought that was the best news I've read in decades that people actually still have a sense that we are a community, that we do need to look after one another. There was that marvellous moment last week where the train, you know, they pushed the train and the man had his leg caught. Did anyone see the get-up meme? It was absolutely brilliant. It said, Joe Hockey, this is what Australians do when someone slips between the gaps. Brilliant. The rhetoric is changing. People are uncomfortable with the full blast of individualistic, winner-takes-it-all, competition and choice, um, all the mantras, the blah-blahs that we've been hearing for a long time. It suddenly got to the point where people go, you know what, I don't like it. It's making me feel bad. It's making me feel more afraid, not just for myself, but for other people. This is fantastic news. This is wonderful news. We need to keep the pressure on about Gonski. I believe it will be an election issue in the next election. I believe they may well have to adopt the full Gonski if they are as unpopular in 2016 as they are now. Because Gonski is a vote winner and a vote changer. Because of that view that people have, they don't want to see poor kids more handicapped. Also, the brilliance of Gonski is it is a sector-blind funding system. For the first time, it brought all the school sectors together. Why the federal government keep resisting it, I still to this day do not understand. Unless, and this is an awful thing to say, and I hope it's not true, but it's the only reason I can come up with. And I use my common sense when I try to think about why people do things. I try to come up with, what's the benefit? Because most people make decisions based on a benefit. Unless they really do want to entrench their own privilege. 
and they actually do understand God's gift. And they see that it is the start of people getting ahead on actual merit rather than because they're members of the Lucky Sperm Club. And I will never support people getting ahead because they're members of the Lucky Sperm Club. I want to see people get ahead because they've actually got talent. Anything else is a disaster for our whole society. Sorry if I had you about common sense. But thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for all the work you do. I know how important it is and I know what a difference you make. You educate the citizens of the future to understand that to have a democracy that functions, we need to have educated voters. Any tin pot dictatorship can create a highly educated elite. There's nothing special about that. Easy to do. What's hard is what you do. A well-educated general population. Thank you for doing it.